I'm going to show you my timeline of special education starting in 1954 and lasting until my prediction of what special, edu special education will look like in 2036. start off with, um, it only makes sense to start with Brown versus Board of Education. This was in 1954 and it was a court case um, where the Supreme Court ruled for equality. Um, first it was a racial equality that was being argued, but afterwards um, parents used this to file lawsuits for disability discrimination as well. Um, Next, we move on to Horace Mann. Um, he believed in universal public education. Um, he believed that education was required. It wasn't a choice that you had whether or not your child was going to go to school. Like It should be a legal requirement um, for your, your student to get an education. Um, how he was going to make this happen is for our tax dollars um, to be used as funding for these public schools. Um, his goal was that kids from different backgrounds should be educated together. Um, he thought that this would help them respect and accept each other. Um, the more you surround yourself with diversity, the less you actually notice your differences. Um, so putting everybody into one classroom, um, whether you're from middle class or poverty level, or you're black or you're white or you're Asian American, it doesn't make a difference. Um, everybody deserves the same education, regardless of what background you come from. Um, and this includes uh, the special education children. If you have a learning disability, that shouldn't hinder you um, from participating and getting the education that you deserve, just like everybody else around you. Next, we move on to uh, the Park and Mills court cases. These happened in the 1970s. Um, Park was a court case dealing with the exclusion of mental retardation in public schools. Um, so basically, they argued that just because you have a disability such as Down syndrome or autism or any kind of mental retardation, that should not prohibit you from getting the education that you deserve. You can't be excluded from class, you can't be excluded from activities such as sports or music or anything that you want to participate in. You are allowed to do it and you should have the right to do it. Um, the decision was that parental participation must be included to resolve these disputes. Um, this makes sense because if you have a child who has some sort of mental disability, um, a lot of times they can't speak up for themselves, they can't argue for what they want to be a part of. Um, they can kind of voice their opinions, but if the school tries to tell them what to do, they aren't going to be able to argue with it. Um, that's when parents need to step in and they need to have a place where they can get due process um, for their kids and get, get kind of a checks and balances situation where you have a right um, to argue and take legal action to make sure that your kid is being accepted and treated equally just like all the other kids his age. Um, so basically um, with PARC, uh, parental participation is a sole proprietor when solving disputes. Um, with Mills, it's a similar case um, except for it's dealing with the suspensions and expulsions of students with disabilities in public schools rather than just basic exclusion. Um, this would probably go into more of the due process, the, the legal processes of um, determining who is right and wrong in the situation of expelling a student. Um, you can't just expel or suspend a student based on, you know, bad behavior if that behavior happens to be caused directly from whatever disability they do have. Um, I really like this quote. Um, it was from the History of Special Education Law article that we were given in our class. Um, it says, with proper education services, many students with disabilities would be able to become productive citizens contributing to society instead of being forced to remain burdens. 
Others would increase independence, thus reducing dependence on society. So basically allowing them and, and giving them the right to stay in school, um, to get the education that they deserve, will not only help them, but also help society as a whole. Um, you don't want to exclude these kids and treat them as different or as like animals or aliens or anything. Um, so treating them as equals will allow them to participate in society just like everybody else. And that's really the overarching goal of it all. Next, we move on to the public law sections 94 through 142, the education for all handicapped children of 1975. Um, in this act, all children with disabilities have the right to education services. Um, processes that include the accountability of state and local education agencies. Um, it moves on from a focus of parental participation in due process um, and focuses more on the accountability that schools have and the state governments should have when dealing with cases that may be discriminatory against disabled students. Um, it kind of goes from just saying that parents have the right to argue this and take this to court um, and goes on to say that here is the way that we are going to hold schools accountable if they are found guilty or in the wrong. Um, it serves as a procedural safeguard um, for students and parents, providing a checks and balances to protect their rights. And that kind of leads into the IDEA Act, which is actually the same thing. Um, it was just amended several times before becoming IDEA. Um, the focus kind of shifts from accountability um, to include uh, emphasis as well as in accountability. And this emphasis is on reading, early intervention, and research-based instruction. Um, this is important because now it's not just somebody telling somebody that they believe something should be a certain way. Now you have to back, um, back your structure, I guess, for teaching your students. Um, so now not only do students with disabilities have the right to be included. Um, they have the right to be educated specifically for what they need. Um, they get a detailed personalized education plan um, that is unique to their own personal needs. Um, it also protects the rights of children and parents, again. Um, IDEA also requires goal establishment that is consistent with the goals and standards for non-disabled students. Uh, for example, No Child Left Behind. Um, this kind of ensures that even though a child may have a learning disability, they can still keep up with everybody else in their class. They can learn to the best of their ability, and it's not so much forcing conformity as much as it is teaching the child in a way that they will understand, in a way that they will actually absorb what they need to know. Uh, my prediction of where special education will be in the years kind of revolves around what what the teacher does. It's not so much it's not so much where I see an education plan going as much as I see like a relationship um, between students and teachers. This means that lectures will adapt to meet the interests of kids. Um, so one thing that I remember was from our I think it was our very first module. Um, we watched a video where one of the teachers said that their student liked to get up and walk around and just pace the classroom while he was learning. And instead of telling him to sit down and pay attention, uh, the teacher got up and walked with him to teach him his lessons. And that's just one really simple way that we can, you know, kind of cater to their needs. Um, that's just one thing that makes them tick. You find out what is important to them and how they like to learn and what they are interested in. And you teach to that rather than making them learn all the ways that they don't understand. Um, it also makes kids want to learn. I mean, nobody wants to learn if you don't understand or if you're bored. Um, but if you can, if you can teach a lecture in a way that 
gets them involved, gets them engaged and interested, then there's a good chance they're actually going to learn the material. Um, regardless of whether or not they have a disability, all they need is a little extra attention and a little bit of personalization. And that goes for all students, not just not just students with disabilities. Um, the goal, I think, isn't to make, isn't to put so much of a focus on special education that it looks different than the rest of education. I think it's more of a way of getting it all to mesh together. That seems the most important to me. Um, this means redesigning the core curriculum as well. Um, this includes adhering to learning diversity as well as just disability. Um, if you just look at the basics of whether a person is an auditory learner or a visual learner, um, this applies to special education. You can't just promise that one one kid with a learning disability is going to learn the same way as another kid with a disability. Um, it all has to be personalized. And I think part of this will help if we focus on skills rather than the subjects. So especially in special education, find what they want to do. Find activities and things like real world applications that they can use and teach them that. Don't I mean, it is important to teach them subjects such as English, reading, language arts, math. Um, but I think we can teach it in ways that are more applicable to actual actual life jobs and goals. Um, it helps society function as a whole if we are teaching with an outcome in mind rather than just test scores. Um, I think it'll also help if I think it'll help them find where they are comfortable and what they like to do. Um, and that goes for everybody. I mean, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I was in even high school. And I think had education been structured a little bit differently um, to be designed for real world application, I probably would have realized earlier on that I, I would like to teach. Um, but I didn't know that because I was never given the opportunity to teach something to anybody. Um, and that goes that goes for anything uh, with with children with disabilities. They might have a knack for something. They might be really good at some talent, whether it's music or art, or sometimes they have very good uh, persuasive skills. I know one. Um, my boss's son actually has autism, and he is. He's very persuasive, you could say. Um, and, you know, everybody has their skill. They fit in somewhere, including children with disabilities. It doesn't make them too different to the point where they can't fit in in some way. And I think in our education system, it's important to find the way that they do fit in and let them fit in. It's also structured more um, to make kids feel at ease and to implement, you know, inclusion and the least restrictive environment possible um, by creating more relationships between you and your individual students. Um, you want them to feel more equal, and that's both your students with disabilities and special education and your regular students. If you can treat them both with the relationships that they need, that personal relationship, there is a better chance that they're going to learn. Um, it helps the children with special education needs uh, to feel more equal if you are giving them the same kind of in-depth relationship that you are giving other students. Um, as we continue moving up, um, more knowledge and awareness of special education is learned. Uh, we will continue moving up and providing the best possible education for all of our students.